Okay, good evening. Thank you for staying so late to attend our session today. Uh, I'm Richard Waymeyer. I'm a senior manager on the Aurora product team. And uh, today we're gonna do a deep dive on both flavors of Amazon Aurora, both Postgres and MySQL compatible. Okay, so you're probably in the wrong room if I need to present this slide, but uh, just in case, what's Aurora? Drop-in compatibility with MySQL and Postgres. Uh, scales significantly higher than a traditional implementation of, of Postgres or MySQL, and tries very hard to give you the availability and reliability of a commercial database while running in open source. So what's happened since the last reInvent? So we'll kick off with, with a couple of notes. So on the Postgres side, we've uh, kicked off Babelfish for Postgres, as well as uh, Babelfish for Aurora. And I'll explain the difference on what those are a little bit later. Um, we also have launched this last year Postgres 12 and Postgres 13, and a number of different extensions for Postgres, including a pretty big update for PostGIS fairly recently. On the MySQL side of the house, we've launched MySQL 8.0 a couple of weeks ago, as well as improved read replica availability and Graviton instance support for both flavors. So let's dig into the architecture a bit, because this is a, a deep dive talk. So we'll, we'll try and go deep on, on, especially on the storage tier. Okay, so first of all, Aurora always runs in three availability zones. So we're always gonna be spread across those three AZs, and that's for our storage tier. You don't have to have three AZs, obviously, for the, the server side, but storage will always be spread across those three AZs. We always have a picture that looks like this with a couple of blocks in it, but it's a misrepresentation of what's actually happening. Behind the scenes, each one of those blocks is tens to hundreds of servers. So we'll spread your storage out across three availability zones, across hundreds to thousands of servers, We'll store your data in 10 gig segments across that fleet with six copies of your data spread across those three availability zones. That's one of the reasons we can claim such high durability numbers for Aurora. Plus we store everything from a backup perspective out to S3. So in a typical uh, single AZ deployment of Aurora, you would have a single instance of either Postgres or MySQL. That's gonna be your writer node. It's going to get a quorum connection to your Aurora storage. It's gonna open it for read write intent. And then your applications from wherever they are can connect up to that instance and it's gonna query the storage. Your storage, as I mentioned a moment ago, is going to be in 10 gig blocks spread out across the three availability zones. Now the representation here isn't meant to say that all of your storage is in one given AZ, simply that we spread that storage out across those availability zones. We do this for reliability and also for scalability. When I go to issue a write, for example, I say insert into my table values one commit transaction. Okay, very straightforward. The log needs to be written out to storage. We will actually issue six asynchronous writes to the Aurora storage tier, one for each location where we know that your storage is targeted at. So each one of those logically speaking, is a machine in the Aurora storage network, we will send that commit down. When four out of six of those commits are acknowledged, and I'll go in gory detail in a few slides on exactly what that means and how we go through the process and decide when it's hardened. When four out of six of those nodes are hardened, the transaction is considered done, and we'll send back an acknowledgement to the actual Postgres or MySQL server saying that the transaction has been committed or the log write has otherwise been done. For a read, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, you will read from a single node in your cluster. Now, why is that? Because one of the things that makes Aurora different than regular Postgres or MySQL is the intelligence is built into the storage tier that would normally happen up on the relational tier. So, if I am going to do that same insert that I talked about before, I'm going to update the data page or the block depending on which database you're talking about and the terminology they prefer in memory. And then eventually I'm gonna copy that data page down to disk. And again, I'll, I'll talk more about that a bit later. In Aurora, we don't do that. We just send the log records down. And then the storage layer replays those log records and updates the data pages and then makes a copy of those data pages out to S3. When I ask Aurora Storage 
for the latest copy of a data page, it knows what version of that page it has. So if I happen to ask on a local server, I go to the first one I want to talk to, and it has the right version, it can just send it to me. Well, what if it doesn't have the right version? It can build one, because it's got all the logs. So it can build the right version of the page and then quickly send it back. Now, most of the time, you won't wait for that because it will have already happened. Now, if you read some of the white papers we publish, we often talk about three out of six for reads. But the, the one out of six is the optimization that you'll actually encounter most of the time. OK, so in this uh, next issue here, we've lost a 10 gig segment. So then what happens in the Aurora storage fleet? It turns out that at the scale of something like an Aurora storage network, this happens all the time. So one of the storage nodes has some kind of failure. In this case, maybe that 10 gig block uh, got corrupted, a CRC check failed, something like that. OK, so what do we do? I just told you a minute ago we have six copies of your data. So what happens if one of them gets corrupted? We go grab another copy from somewhere else preferably the same AZ, but it doesn't have to be, right? Some copy that's electrically near us, and we make a copy of that 10 gig segment and replace it, so we self-repair. Now, because you only need four out of six to commit and get a quorum, it has no effect whatsoever on availability because you were still at five out of six, so we repaired it, and you never know what happened. There won't be an entry in your log, just no need for you to know. It just self-heals. What happens if we lose an entire storage server? It's logically speaking exactly the same process, except now the workload's going to spread out across multiple other servers, or we provision new servers and add them to the Aurora fleet, either one. Uh, but either way, again, doesn't matter. So you went down to five out of six, we make a copy, we get it up and running, we spread it out again, and it just works. Same exact issue, by the way, if one of these storage nodes get busy. So imagine that storage node there with the, the block on it wasn't down, it didn't fail, it's just really, really busy. So what do we do? We start spreading the load out across other storage nodes and spread the workload until it's not busy anymore. Again, all completely transparent to you. The storage fleet here is the intelligence that really makes the difference in Aurora. What about read replicas? We support up to 15 read replicas per cluster. So the read replica is going to be instantiated if you're only going to do one, you would want to do it very much like what's on the slide. You'd want to put it in a different availability zone so that if you need to fail over, the replica target is in a different AZ. That way, if something went wrong in an AZ, it's going to be able to take over and run. It also opens the exact same storage. So unlike in a traditional Postgres or MySQL environment like RDS, or if you were doing it yourself or building it on EC2, there's not a separate copy of the storage for the read replicas. So I'm going to talk to the same Aurora storage fleet, and I'm going to open that fleet, except now in read-only mode, and use that for my database. You'll also see that blue line going from the read replica, or rather from the writer node, over to the read replica. What that's doing is if I'm performing that same insert that we talked about a moment ago, I insert into table T1 at a value. I'm going to ship that log record down to Aurora Storage. I'm actually going to send six copies of it down and get an update from that. Simultaneously with that, I'm asynchronously going to ship it to the read replicas. And then on the read replica, it's going to read that log entry and say, do I have this page in memory? If I do, update my local buffer pool. It's strictly an optimization to make sure I don't have to go back to the storage fleet every time I want to see if my page is up to date. So we'll stream the log records across to the read replica, as well as being able to get all of the data pages directly from storage. What happens if T1 wasn't in the buffer pool for my read replica? We throw the log update away. We don't care about it. It's not like we're going to send it to storage. The writer is responsible for that. OK. I mentioned before we can have 15 read replicas. Do be aware that every single read replica is going to have to get that log stream from the writer node. So it's not free to add. 15 read replicas, there is a load that's going to be placed on the writer node. Now, it's not dramatic, but it is a load, and you do want to be conscious of that. So each one of those connections will have a log record flowing to it, and each one of those is going to open up the Aurora storage network to access the data. OK, now let's talk about failures up a little higher in the stack. So what happens if my database crashes? So 
It happens, right? <laughs> We'd prefer that the, the database never crashes, but if it does, for the most part, we do the, what you'd think of as the common sense thing. We try and restart the database process. So if MySQL or Postgres dies, we attempt to restart it. We use the same machine. We're running on EC2 hosts here. It's not uh, magic there. That, so we'll, we'll take your EC2 host. We'll, if there's some peripheral thing that needs to be cleaned up, we'll do a quick cleanup, and then we'll restart your process. The buffer pool lives in a separate address space, so we don't lose the buffer pool when we have to restart Postgres or MySQL. So that's the normal failure scenario, I would say, for Postgres or MySQL, is a restart on that same server. If we can't do that, or if the server's really gone, then what happens? Then we fail over to the appropriately provisioned read replica that you've identified as the highest priority target for a read replica failover, and that's why it's so important to have that replica. Now, why did I suggest we have it in a different AZ? It's because what if that failure wasn't my EC2 host, but the entire availability zone? What's an availability zone? Just a, re a quick refresher. It is one or more physical data centers. So for an AZ to go offline, uh, something tragic happened to the building, or somebody used tobacco in front of a large set of uh, fiber cables. I've seen all of those failures. But in any event, temporarily speaking, or permanently, you can't get to that AZ. So it's much better for you from an availability perspective if you fail over. Makes no difference whatsoever to the storage. The storage has still got what? Four out of six, right? So I'm still up and running. Now, am I at higher risk that something could go wrong? Theoretically, absolutely. But I'm still up and running with four out of six when I lose an entire availability zone. Okay. So we've got a feature global database for Aurora that we've designed for disaster recovery. The way global database works is it takes a copy of the Aurora storage and says, I'm going to put a copy of that storage in a different region. So in this scenario, for example, let's say uh, your server on the left or your region on the left rather is Oregon and the region on the right, let's say is Virginia. So I'm going to say my primary instance of my primary cluster is in Oregon. That's where my read-write connection is gonna be, and that's where all writes need to happen. Now, you go into the console or through the CLI and you say, I want global database and I want it to be in Virginia. So we'll set up a copy of the cluster with Aurora storage. Behind the scenes, we're provisioning some replication servers or using an existing fleet of replication servers. Either one will happen. So we'll set up some replication agents on those servers or provision those servers, and then we'll copy all the data across. And we'll make a synchronous copy, all of this happening on the Amazon backbone. Then what happens when you make a change? I, I, I recognize my sample is rather simple, but insert into T1 values one. I do it again, and now what happens? So I'm gonna have to send that log record out. I'm gonna send that to the read replicas Guess what global database looks like to the writer? It's a read replica. So I send it out, it goes out to the replication server as a read replica, and in fact it takes a read replica slot. So now I can't have 15 read replicas in my cluster, I can have 14 because I have the 15th as Virginia. That request is sent down to the replication server, sent across the backbone, and applied to storage. And guess what? We've got disaster recovery because now I've got a full copy of all my data with six copies, as a matter of fact, not just a full copy, but six copies spread across three AZs in another region. Now, something you'll notice here, I don't have any servers running in Virginia. It's totally fine. Works great. The storage is there. Anytime you want to go in and add a server to that cluster, you can do so. But it works perfectly fine in a headless configuration. If I want to, I can add read replicas there. And the nice thing about that is that it doesn't count as additional read replicas. The remote region is one read replica, and you can have 15 read replicas in there, and it's all gonna work. Now what happens when a change comes through? It's gonna go to the read replica and invalidate the cache if there's a, a matching page in exactly the same way it would have done before, and it will go simultaneously to the storage tier and update the storage. I can have several, I can spread those out, and I can run my read queries in the remote region. Usually you'd wanna do this obviously for, uh, to reduce latency. 
That's the sort of the number one reason. And to take advantage of the fact that you paid for the DR solution, so you may as well use it. Uh, I've seen lots of folks do both. So as changes come in, they're going to replicate across. They're going to continue to go across the Amazon backbone and into that storage fleet on the other side. And it's just going to keep it up to date. So now, what happens if, uh, heaven forbid, we have a regional failure? Now, most of the time, what's going to be a regional failure? It's going to be a software deployment that went bad, uh, a network connection <laughs> that went bad, uh, some misconfiguration that we did that screwed things up, or some natural disaster. All of the above could theoretically happen and take a region out. So you've paid to have us have a DR copy of your database, and we've got that copy. When you replicate data from a writer to a read replica, it's always asynchronous inside of the cluster. It's also always asynchronous when it goes across the network for disaster recovery. So what does that mean if I have a crash or I don't otherwise know the state of the region? It means if I were to fail over, there might be data loss because I've, I've made asynchronous copies of your data. I don't know if all of the copies of the data and all the log changes made it to the remote region. For that reason, we require you to manually promote the remote replica. So you have to choose to do a failover cross region because there might be data loss. So you go into the console or through the CLI again and promote that region to now be the writer region. We disconnect you from the region that's failed. So you're no longer in the console. You, you'll notice that it's no longer affiliated with the original uh, region. It'll now be a standalone cluster. And it's open for read write. From that point on, it's literally just an ordinary Aurora cluster. Well, what about lots of these? I could have a good use case for one region for DR, but what about that data locality issue? What, what couldn't I say, hey, I've got Oregon and Virginia, but why not throw in Ireland? And why not throw in Singapore? Works perfectly fine. We'll do up to five regions. We'll keep it up to date. As you might imagine, latency starts to be a real issue uh, uh, when you start crossing uh, oceans. So do be aware that if you are replicating, for example, from Oregon to, uh, to Singapore, you're going to have a bit more latency from, say, Oregon to Virginia. Or a lot of people will replicate Virginia to Ohio for exactly that reason. Each region counts as a replication slot. So now, in this configuration, I can have 12 readers in my original cluster. So remember that when you're adding these remote regions. But guess what? Each of these remote regions can have as many readers as you want, up to 15. Doesn't affect the reader count. They're, they're all going to send those asynchronous connections across the network and update it. You'll notice in this example, I've also got region D as headless, in addition to having some read replicas in the other regions. And again, all of that's just going to work transparently. That's part of what the service we're offering. For Aurora MySQL, we have a feature called Global Database Write Forwarding. So in Global Database Write Forwarding, what we offer is a solution to this problem. I've got an application running in my same scenario as before, so I've got Oregon and Virginia, and this application in Virginia tries to issue that insert statement. Well, the database is open read-only. It can't issue a write to the cluster, so it'll get a failure message. So, but I could work around that, right? In my application, I could make a connection back to the cluster in Oregon and issue that insert statement. I could, but that's a lot of work for me, and then I've got to wait for it to replicate back, just like you'd expect. But what I can do in MySQL is enable global database write forwarding. Once I've done that, that insert statement will now magically process, or will appear to magically process to you. What in fact is happening is exactly what you might expect. We forward the insert statement across the network to Oregon, to the writer node there, and issue the insert. Then what do you think happens? It replicates it back exactly the same as any other change would have come across, and it shows back up on the server. This is not something you want to do to get the same throughput as you would get from a writer. This is meant for the occasional application that has, whoops, I forgot, I ran an insert, an update, or a delete. It is not meant as a scalability mechanism. It's meant as a mechanism to prevent you from having to do an occasional write operation. All right, let's shift gears and talk a little bit more at the next layer down inside of the picture of Aurora Storage.
why do we claim that we have better throughput than regular Postgres or regular MySQL? It's largely based in the fact that A, we have scale out storage, but B, we do less work. And here's an example of what we're talking about. This is a sort of a classic example of Postgres. I've got a block in memory, which is Postgres term for a page, and I've got my write ahead log or wall log. I update T and set Y equals six. So what's gonna happen? Well, we're gonna put a copy of that image into the log, and we're gonna put a full copy of that data page into the log as well, and I'll explain why in just a second. Then we're gonna continue to make some changes on the table. Those changes are gonna continue to be logged. Now, regular relational databases, and by regular I mean Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, everybody, does a checkpoint operation. A checkpoint says, take all of the changed pages in memory and push them out to the disk to harden them. So what's gonna happen? Well, we're gonna write that data page to the data file, or probably in tens, hundreds, thousands of data pages, and we're gonna write the log records out to the archive location. And in our case, for example, if this were RDS Postgres, that would be S3. But Postgres page sizes are 8K, and we're running on Linux, and Linux has a page size of 4K. So what happens if half of the page writes and the other half doesn't? We call this a torn page. I've got a, a problem here. I've logically got corruption. So how do I recover from that? Well, that's very straightforward. I've got a full copy of that page in my log file, so I can apply that page to my data file and then roll forward all the log entries to recover. That's great, works really well. You get recovery in a few minutes. So reliable mechanism, makes a lot of sense, just works. What happens in Aurora? So update T, set Y equals six. Okay, so I make that change and I put that log record in the log queue and then push that log record down to Aurora storage, okay? Do another insert, push that log record down. We don't do checkpoints. We didn't write any data pages, why is that? Because the Aurora storage tier is intelligent, it knows how to take log records, replay them, and turn them into data pages. So we don't need to ever push the data pages down. So we do a lot less work. We do a lot less I.O. from not having to push these data pages down to disk. That's part of why we can get more throughput in Aurora than we could with a regular instance of Postgres. Okay, so in this case, what's happening behind the scenes is we're continuously performing recovery in the storage fleet. So when you recover with Aurora, you can recover significantly faster because we've already recovered. We're doing it all the time in the storage fleet. So when you restart the database and say, catch me up, it's like, okay. So it's quite quick. And of course, at all times, we're hardening all of those log record changes into S3 as well. Very, very similar story in MySQL, so I'll go a little faster through this. Do my insert, do my checkpoint. MySQL has a different philosophy on how they do logging, so they write this um, full block into what's called a double write buffer. Then they write to the data file, and they archive out the log records. Same problem, except bigger, because my SQL data page by default is 16K. So I get the same problem. How do I recover? I copy the full block over and put it in place and then roll forward any log entries. But I still have to do checkpoint, and in fact, in my SQL, I'm writing even more. So what's the Aurora story? This is gonna look a little familiar, so I'll go really quick. It's write the log records down to storage and have them update the data pages. So no engine checkpoints, no double, by, double write buffer, so a lot less work going on. And again, the recovery is happening continuously in the background. So MySQL and Postgres work fundamentally identically from that feature perspective. Now let's go inside of an Aurora storage node. So there's actually a number of different types of computers being used inside of the Aurora storage fleet. A couple of them you've seen on the slides. We have replication servers that hold replication agents to do global database. The key component that you see represented on all of our slides, whatever we present at a conference or, or talk about Aurora in a, in a sales call or something is gonna be these storage nodes. So a storage node is going to be the target for when you're issuing those insert, update, or delete operations and pushing those log records down. So I've got an Aurora read-write node. 
I make a change. Change A, or LSN1, if you want to think of it as LSNs, comes down into the incoming queue. We make sure we've actually got that log record. We push it down into our hot log. At that point, we acknowledge that record A has been received. So when I talked about pushing six writes down and waiting for four of them to come back, that's when we acknowledge that that log record has been received because it's been pushed from memory into something more durable. Now I push record C through. It comes down into my incoming queue and pushes into my hot log. But as you may have gotten a hint from, the fact that the slide shows a gap, it turns out there was a record B change. How do we know that? Because we know the log sequence numbers and we recognize that, hey, there's something missing there. So what do we do? Well, we talk to our peers in the Aurora storage fleet and say, hey, anybody got a copy of B? So somebody says, yep, I've got a copy of B. Here you go. They send that to us. We get a coalesced version of the log that we're comfortable with that, that is, we're sure is the right sequence and it's periodic intervals. We'll now push those log records out into the update queue, and then we'll go through and update the data pages that were affected by those log records. Guess what? At all times, we're also continuously pushing the hot log down to S3 for preservation, for recovery. Our official stance, if you read the documentation, is five minute recovery. In practice, we're sending those log records down pretty much continuously. And then guess what? Just like you'd expect, we also push the data pages down so that we can recover faster, so we don't have to play so many log records. Now because of that, when that read request comes in, I've got an updated version of my data page with all of my log records applied. So at any given moment, I've always got the, the latest version, or in Postgres's case, multiple versions of the data page, depending on which version you want to ask for, or we can build it because we have all the log records handy. Okay, what about cloning? Another cool feature we've got in Aurora that I think is actually an underused feature is fast clones. So what a clone allows you to do is spin up another cluster for Aurora. It'll otherwise look exactly the same as any other cluster that you would create, but it's going to get a copy of your data from the original cluster that you're cloning. Logically speaking, it's getting a copy. What's actually going to happen is what I'm gonna show you here on the slide. So we go ahead and spin up a clone because we wanna go do something like run a large series of reports and we'd rather not interfere with our production workload. And maybe we wanna run two or three index creates that are unique to the reporting application. We don't want it to screw up our OLTP work. And then I wanna run those indexes, create them, run my reports, and then throw it all away. Cause, and then I'll do it all over again next week, for example. So I create a clone of my Aurora cluster, particularly handy if that Aurora cluster say 100 terabytes, right? It's much, much faster because I don't actually create a copy of the data. I create a logical set of pointers to the data and that's the storage for the clone. So creating a clone just takes a few minutes. You spin up the, the head node instance and then you're actually pointing at your original server storage. So how does that work? I have my reporting application now, I come in, I run a query, I'm gonna go fetch the data. Well, if the data hasn't changed from the time I asked for the clone to be created, I go back and I grab the copy of the data that was from the original cluster. Has no effect whatsoever on the primary cluster because this storage fleet isn't five or six or 10 or 20 boxes, it's hundreds to thousands. So that node gets the data from the original clusters 10 gig segment, I show pages here, but it's, you know, it's reading out of the 10 gig segments, and then grabs that up and returns it to the instance that was the clone. Now what happens if I make a change? I told you I wanted to create an index. So I go create a change. We make a copy of the original server's page. So you can think of this as thin provisioning in a way. I make a copy of that page and then make the change there. Again, no effect whatsoever on the original server. It doesn't know you made a change because it knows nothing about this new page. So we can do that all we want. We can insert new rows, add new data pages, works perfectly fine. By the way, this is a fantastic use case for testing blue-green deployments. Uh, you can, for example, get out there and create new indexes and then see what happens on your actual production data instead of guessing on a test system. Now what happens, I haven't mentioned it at all, my original cluster. It's gonna make changes, right? So it comes in, uh, at least usually it's going to be busy doing something. And guess what, when I add new data, it's only up there on top because 
the clone will be as of the time you asked for the clone to be created and will give you a version of the data as of that moment. So anything that's inserted, updated, or deleted, new data is added, it's not reflected in the clone. I come down here, though, and I change an existing data page. We're going to make a copy of the data page for your clone. So the storage network knows about the clone. The write node in your cluster doesn't. So this is nothing you do. You won't see any impact on your server. It's just happening down in the storage fleet. It makes a copy of the before image before it makes the change so that your clone has full access to that data. Another thing we added recently, or fairly recently, was uh, the ability to dynamically resize your database. So this is a handy feature that'll save you money. So let's imagine we've got a scenario that's set up on the slide here. I've got a bunch of partitions of a database. So I've got uh, enough partitions that um, I can fill each one up on a regular time interval and we suppose for the case of the example here that normally we fill up the same amount of data. So you see over the progression of time here, I add partition, I add partition, I add partition, we fill it with some data, and roughly speaking, I get to a study state. So I get to a study state, I've got the same number of partitions. As I roll off partitions and add new ones, my storage is roughly gonna stay the same. But then something happens and I get a big spike. Let's say it's Cyber Monday and people are placing some orders and you're now still gainfully employed, so all that's great. But it causes a big spike in the data storage. And then it happens for another set of intervals of time. So now I've got lots more data than I had before. In fact, I've doubled the size of my storage in my table. So what's gonna happen? Well, Aurora's gonna handle it, right? It's just gonna add more 10 gig segments and it's gonna scale up just fine. And you know, we're, we're really nice fellows, we're going to bill you for it. So we're gonna bill all the storage that you actually use. So I've got my storage as it increments up, I'm gonna increment my bill as well, and as those drop existing create news happen, turns out that's gonna be largely steady state. So my bill doesn't change, but then when I've got this spike, I add up that storage, and now I'm gonna pay that higher amount for the storage. Well, if everything then continues on a happy path, and we go back to normal sales, all of those big, partitions are still going to remain until they age out. So once those partitions get old and I start dropping them and cycling in regular size partitions, I'm going to use less storage, right? Because I'm going to free up, in this case, 100 some odd gigabytes. And then I drop that and I drop that. And the space inside of my server is significantly smaller. Now this is sort of a, a contrived example for the screen, but I can assure you I've received customer calls asking why when they just wanted to find out if, if Aurora really did hold 64 terabytes of data back in the day and they threw in 64 terabytes of data and then they dropped it, why they were still getting a bill for 64 terabytes. Because this is the normal use case scenario for a database. You allocated that much space until you do something dramatic or run an, uh, an operation it's gonna be using that space. We'll, we'll reuse it eventually is the theory of relational database people, right? Because we like to add more and more data. Quite literally, you'd have 64 or 128 terabytes of pages with a bunch of zeros in them. And we'll back those up and we'll charge you for the backups and we'll charge you for the, for the storage, at least we would have, because the space is actually allocated to you. It really is used. With this new shrink feature, we say, hey, that, that's not great. So why don't we do this? Why don't we auto shrink down those storage pages. So now, over time, we will recover that space. Now you'll notice that there's a slight difference in the lines here. Now why is there a difference? Why isn't it exactly the smaller space that you used? Because we got, you go back to that principle that we talked about before. How is Aurora storage allocated? 10 gig segments. So we're not gonna perfectly clean up every 10 gig segment and shrink it down to be exactly the space you used, there's gonna be a little bit of rounding in there. There's gonna be some segments that aren't quite full or something like that. So you will see a slight differentiation. But that's space that can be used and will be allocated to you. But we will recover the vast majority of that space now and then therefore lower your bill. So now your actual space used is gonna be very closely aligned. I have had some recent customer escalations wondering why they weren't seeing this do be aware that we still have versions active in the fleet that don't support this. So do make sure that if you want to use this feature, you go look at the feature page, it'll tell you what version of Aurora, MySQL, or Postgres you need to be on to have support for this. 
So you definitely want to do this because, like I said, save you a bit of money. All right, let's talk about MySQL briefly. MySQL had a, a, a big week a couple weeks ago, shipped MySQL 8.0. Uh, the details are all up on the slide. The big thing to know about this is a change in philosophy. So if you were on MySQL 5.6 or 5.7, and I told you I need to make sure that a fix that came in in 5.7.22 was in your version of Aurora, how could you figure that out? Well, you could call us, and we'll dig around and tell you whether that change was committed. But that's a little bit awkward. How would you do that in Postgres? Well, if you said it's fixed in Aurora Postgres 13.4 and it's picked in Community Postgres 13.4, you know it's fixed in both because it's just the same community version number. Starting with MySQL 8.0.23, if I remember correctly, yep, 23, which we'll call Aurora 3.01, we will now align community versions of MySQL with the Aurora versions. So you'll be able to know that if something is fixed in a particular community version of MySQL 8, you can map that directly back to an Aurora MySQL version in much the same way you've been able to do for quite some time with Postgres. So a big change in philosophy is the most important thing. And of course, lots of cool features. Uh, you know, if you look through the list, things like windowing functions and CTEs are obviously very, very handy. Improved availability of read replicas. This started in MySQL 2.10, which is one of the 5.7 builds, or higher. And this is a feature whereby if I had that failure we talked about before, something went wrong with my MySQL instance, we'll try and restart the writer. So we'll just restart that process right on the server. But in the meantime, that'll require us to reestablish Quorum as read-write owner for the cluster. The way we did that also threw out all the read replicas from their connection, and then they had to read connect. So what happens to all of your long-running read queries on your read replicas? Well, they get canceled, and you have to resubmit them. Starting with this feature on 2.10 or higher, those read replicas, for the most part, most of the time, will stay up and running, even for a failover, a multi-AZ failover of the writer in MySQL. So that feature was rolled out for MySQL. Again, it's going to apply for the newly released MySQL 8. And you can imagine that uh, we're a little jealous on my side of the house, I work on the Postgres side, so we'll be getting to it. All right. OK. Uh, oops, wrong button, that's why. All right, Postgres updates. So the biggest thing uh, recently was Postgres 13, late this summer. And I'm not going to read you the list uh, of the Postgres features. But the point I wanted to make with this slide is we are focusing on getting major version support. Yes, we've heard your feedback. Uh, we added 12 and 13 since the last reInvent. We're focused on getting you a preview of 14 pretty soon. And then we're going to be looking at getting 14 relatively early next year. At least that's the hope. So we're focusing on getting very much better at concurrency with these major versions for Postgres. So it's not just that Postgres 13 is really nice, and it is, but we are working very hard on 14. Now, philosophically, though, I did want to mention that we aren't interested in going after the very first release of a new major build. We wait till the first point one release before we start looking at adding that out. So you won't see us release 14.0. It'll always be at least 14.1. All right. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some stuff that's uh, been either very close or uh, announced here at reInvent. The first one I want to talk about is serverless v2. Now, serverless v2 is going to make a lot of uh, uh, promises that may sound a bit familiar. Everything just magically works. It scales up and scales down. It scales up quite quickly. Um, and you say, OK, that's great. That's why I want serverless stuff. It's bullet point number three that's revolutionary here. Serverless v2 is just like a provision server. All the same capabilities that you could do with provision to Aurora, you can now do in serverless. So if I want a read replica that's serverless and a writer node that's provisioned, OK, go ahead. You want to have auto scaling, you, you know, we've got these features to auto scale read replicas, and you can create groups with those. Well, now just make those nodes serverless, and they'll scale up and scale down and just work. Correct. 
So serverless is just another option. So I can add a node and say, I want that read replica to be serverless, but this read replica will be provisioned in a fixed size in the same cluster. Right. And, and well, I'm not going to talk about pricing yet because it hasn't released. But, but it, yes, absolutely. And that's the, the classic use case is I need a whole lot more read replicas during the week. Or maybe sometimes I only need replicas periodically during the day. And when I'm not using them, let them scale down to nearly nothing and keep running. All the features that work with Aurora, including things like logical replication, now work on serverless. It's just another thing you can put in your cluster. What I wanted to drill into, though, is buffer pool management, because this is where we're doing an, uh, probably the, the trickiest part of the work here to make serverless really work. And that is we're going deep into the engines for both Postgres and MySQL to make sure we do memory allocation for shrink. Grow is easy, right? <laughs> Give me more RAM. OK. My buffer pool is great. I've got lots of empty pages now, and I can grow stuff. So very, very quickly, we'll scale up. And, and now I've got lots of extra data pages. And we go ahead and change the Postgres and MySQL settings to make all this work as you'd expect. You don't have to do anything. It'll just change with the serverless configuration as it detects that we need either more CPU or more memory, and we'll scale up. Down, on the other hand, is tricky because we have to make sure that we get rid of the right data pages out of the buffer cache. Because if we end up getting rid of the wrong ones, we'll drive up your I.O. costs unnecessarily. So. Let's go through an example of buffer pool resizing. So I've got, obviously, some data pages that I'm going to reference more often than others. So in this uh, visualization, the red pages are hit very, very frequently. And then over time, we're going kind to of use a combination of a least recently used and also a frequency of access algorithms to figure out where pages rank in the hierarchy of how they're used. And it's not necessarily the case that it's necessarily the most recently used that's going to be at the top. So for example, in this uh, case that I've got here, I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of page reads because I've gone off and done some reads. They don't go at the top because I'm still using those red pages far more frequently than the one-time access I got from going off and fetching some data pages off disk. Okay, So we put them into the queue. Everything works. Buffer pool is fine. Now your workload slows down. Those developers doing their reporting, they, they go home or they go out for lunch. So what's going to happen here? Well, we've got to figure out how to shrink that buffer pool. That means some pages need to go away. So we're going to take the end of that queue. We're going to push those pages out. And now we can perform the shrink operation in preparation for actually shrinking the instance size. So we go ahead and shrink the size of your buffer pool, again, making sure that we evict the pages that not necessarily were the most recently used, but were the most recently used and the less frequently used as well. So both things together. And then we make all that seamlessly work in Postgres and MySQL, so you'll never know. And you don't have to do any tuning. It just works. So that's really, in, in our view, the, uh, the secret sauce that's going to really make, I'm sure the serverless guys that worked on the CPU scaling would disagree with me, but I think this buffer, buffer thing is very, very cool and the secret sauce that really makes uh, serverless, really exciting. Plus, can't emphasize enough, doing all the same stuff that a provision instance will do. So it's really going to change, uh, I think, the shape of a lot of Aurora clusters. If you were at the keynote this morning, you saw that we've launched DevOps Guru for RDS. So what is DevOps Guru? Well, there's the marketing page, ML-powered capability uh, to automatically detect, diagnose, and tell you about operational things that you want to fix. What's really going on behind the scenes? This only works on Performance Insights-enabled clusters. That should give you a hint of what we're actually doing behind the scenes. We're using Performance Insights data to figure out when we see anomalies. So here I've got a, a, a Performance Insight uh, anomaly detection mechanism. It sees that something went wrong there. And so it goes and looks and says, what, what was different? What did we find? Well, in this case, we saw, hey, look at that. There's a bunch of extra locking going on. And there's the queries that cause that extra locking. So what do we do about that? Well, maybe in this case, it's because there was too much memory pressure. So now we'll run that through our algorithms. If everything looks like, hey, that's probably something you could do, and you might need to take action on that, then we'll pop up alerts to you saying, hey, we found this anomaly. The way you would address that is by performing the following actions. And we'll give that messaging back to you. 
so that you can take actions instead of having to dig into all these logs yourself. All right, migration. Let's talk a bit about migration. So this is not new. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, most of the migration methods that we've had before and had for a few years are still here. DMS and SCT are still very, very uh, popular. We're getting very, very large numbers of databases migrated now. Um, it, from a perspective of, of what is Aurora, you'll always hear us use the legal name Aurora Postgres MySQL Compatible Edition, or excuse me, Aurora, Amazon Aurora MySQL Compatible Edition, Amazon Aurora Postgres Compatible Edition. That does not mean it's not really MySQL or Postgres running under the covers. It's absolutely running the code plus all the Aurora goodness wrapped around it. So that means things like pgdump and pgrestore work perfectly fine on Aurora. It means that MySQL can take their backups with MySQL dump. You can use Percona extra backup because it really is the MySQL interface. It really is the MySQL core system. It really is Postgres running there. <coughs> so I can migrate in or out, by the way, with any of those tools. If you're on RDS, you can do a snapshot import or a feature uh, that we frequently see used these days is RDS read replica migration. So just a couple of slides on this. If I've got RDS running with, uh, let's say Postgres, I can create a read replica that's actually an Aurora cluster. So we're gonna go ahead and set up that read replica. We'll take a snapshot, we'll restore it into Aurora. Then we'll catch up via asynchronous replication. And then I can promote that Aurora cluster and now I've effectively failed over from RDS to Aurora. So that's a nice migration method if you choose to migrate from RDS to, to Aurora. But we've got a new option this year, shipped uh, a few weeks ago, and that's Babelfish. So Babelfish is an open source project. We've released it in, uh, in, into the community. So it's uh, babelfishpg.org is, is the home of the code. So you can actually go look at the source code and see what we've done. We're also shipping it as part of Aurora Postgres 13. So what's Babelfish all about? Babelfish is about commercial migration. So we get an awful lot of customers asking us to move from SQL Server to Aurora Postgres. How would you have done that? You go out with SCT, figure out how to migrate your schema, you use DMS to do a, a migration from SQL Server into Postgres, and then you start the hard part. You gotta convert all your applications. What Babelfish does is it implements not only additional compatibility with T-SQL, but it implements the wire protocol so that I can take a SQL Server application, speaking the SQL Server wire protocol and have it listen on the Aurora Postgres instance and your developer application will think it's talking to SQL Server because it's gonna use all the same protocols. So we're gonna go through and make that look like uh, it's still gonna think it's still talking to a SQL Server. Now we are not trying to replicate SQL Server here. We are trying to migrate you to Aurora Postgres. So this is an acceleration mechanism to get you moved over to Aurora. So what are you gonna see here? You're gonna see your regular Postgres port, 5432 or whatever port you wanna put it on, and your regular Postgres applications work. You're still talking to Aurora Postgres. But if you turn on Babelfish, you'll also see port 1433, SQL Server's default, or whatever port you wanna put it on, and you can connect with a SQL Server application to Aurora Postgres. Now, are you talking to the same Aurora instance? Absolutely. You'll still have a cluster endpoint, you'll just change the port number, and you'll use the TDS stream protocol instead of the Postgres protocol to connect. How did we do that? We did that because Postgres has a fantastic extension model. So if you have a regular Postgres extension that you might use all the time without thinking about it, like pgstat statements, you, you, you probably don't think about it because Postgres just extends itself with this mechanism. So we took advantage of that extension mechanism for Babelfish and we said, okay, let's go ahead and add Babelfish T-SQL enhancements. So we've taken a bunch of the T-SQL language constructs and implemented them in Postgres as an extension. Guess what, we also then implemented a TDS listener. TDS, tabular data streams, the wire protocol for SQL Server, it's open source, it's public. So we built a listener for Postgres and published it and it hooks in and then queries can connect up and run using those SQL Server drivers and that wire protocol. Throw on top of that some common functionality and the money data type because there were some uh, funky variations there that we'll not get into here. And you've got Postgres 
except Postgres that now speaks T-SQL and now talks SQL Server driver language. So if I want to migrate, I have a second option. I can still use SCT and DMS and migrate directly into Postgres, but then I've got to convert all my applications. With Babelfish, I can say, you know what, I'm going to do uh, a partial step. I'm going to bring over things, but I'm going to bring them over as if they were SQL Server. I'm going to keep my T-SQL applications. I'm going to bring over my SQL data with SQL data types, not converting them to Postgres. And I'm going to just move my applications and point them from my SQL Server at my Aurora Postgres instance. And voila, I've migrated a lot faster than it would have been if you had to go convert all of those applications to speak natively to Postgres. And now you can do the rest of the migration at your leisure, assuming you want to do the rest of the migration. If you're happy with Babelfish, you can stay on it. If you uh, want to finish migrating natively into Postgres, you can do that over time. All right, so Postgres clients, again, going to spoke 5432 like we talked about. SQL clients connect up. Again, exactly the same cluster of Postgres, the same instance, so nothing, uh, nothing different there. But how did we make that happen? Well, here's a, a simple diagram of exactly what, what's going on under the covers. On the right is a SQL Server description. And this is a very standard layout of SQL Server. If you're a SQL Server person, you'll say, well, yeah, of course. And if you're not, well, you can decipher the slide later. But you've got your system databases, master, tempdb, model, msdb, those sorts of system databases are normal in a SQL Server instance. And then I create my user databases. In the slide example here, I've got a DBA, a DBB, and a DBC database. When I migrate into Babelfish, we actually create a custom database in Postgres. It's still, I shouldn't say custom, it's a Postgres database, except it's always called Babelfish DB. And then we use schemas inside of that database to emulate SQL Server databases. So when you come in through the Babelfish endpoint and you say use database A, because that's what I was using on SQL Server, we'll put you into that schema inside of the Babelfish database. And then when you run your T-SQL queries, Postgres is wonderfully extendable. It now speaks T-SQL in addition to regular Postgres, so it can now run your SQL queries and return the results over that data. But it's still in Postgres. So if I want to start up Postgres admin and connect up and troll through all this and say, hey, where's all the data? And could I point at that data and grab a copy of it and use it in Postgres? The answer is absolutely yes, because it's in Postgres. So now I've migrated my data, but I still let my applications work as if I were still thinking I'm talking to SQL Server. So a really good acceleration mechanism. Now, this is a V1. We just launched it. It's out in the open source community. We intend to be serious about that open source. So we hope that you will go grab this project and add the T-SQL features that we haven't done yet. Now, we're going to be publishing a roadmap on GitHub. We're going to be developing in GitHub. So it really is going to be an open source project. It really is going to be a series of extensions. And periodically, we're going to snapshot that code, pull it back into Aurora, and ship it. So you're going to see regular updates on Aurora, but you're also going to see community updates making their way into Aurora now, just like they would with any other extension that's developed in the community. All right, so that's Babelfish, and we're super excited about that. A um, little short on Aurora sessions at reInvent this year, you may have noticed. Uh, just me and Serverless for the, for the breakout sessions, as well as uh, Rudy's uh, uh, What's New in RDS. But we have a number of breakouts, chalk talks, and builder sessions. Strongly encourage you to participate, get your hands on it, talk to the experts that have flown in here to, to make your reInvent experience better. Really want to thank you for staying this late and uh, appreciate your uh, coming to reInvent this year, and uh, thank you very much.